Amen. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, choir and orchestra. What a great day. It is true. His truth is marching on and it marches on through those of us who keep in step with the spirit. It's how Paul described it. We keep in step with the truth. Eugene Peterson was the one who described the Christian life as a long obedience in the same direction. The Christian life and together, you can sense it today, even as we sang together, we're marching together. And this, this kind of militant spirit is one, here's the twist, it's one where we live out our lives loving others as Jesus has loved us. And, and we, we live out the truth that transforms us. Just want to tell you, give a report to all of our church family. These are exciting days. And if you're watching us online or uh, maybe you're a guest, maybe you're a first time guest. I've met some of you today. We're so glad that you're here. I write uh, notes, letters, uh, notes to people. We send letters to folks who join our church every week. This past week, uh, I wrote more notes. We sent more letters to people who joined our church last week and recent days, um, more than I have, have done in a long time. I mean, even pre-pandemic. God is at work. His truth is marching on. And his church is prevailing regardless of what it looks like or what you're hearing from culture. We're going to talk about that a bit today. I want you to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Again, we're going to uh, preach the word of God. Then we're going to close our time. We thought no better way than to share in communion across all of our venues today. As you're turning to 1 Timothy, and I hope you brought your Bible with you, uh, we're going to read this together here in a moment. This is a passage that's called, you know, in different sections of scripture, sometimes you'll see a title for certain sections. Those were added later, of course, but this is called the great apostasy. It's called the falling away. Another translation has the rebellion. Kind of an ominous feel to it, doesn't it? Kind of a Star Wars spiritual rebellion is what we're going to talk about. And today on the 4th of July, this is a good day to talk about the, the freedom that we have and then how we steward this freedom by being committed to the Lord. Michael Novak wrote a book some years ago now called On Two Wings. He expressed in it um, what others have, have expressed. The idea is that the American eagle flies on two wings. The American experiment would only work, our founding fathers knew, on two wings, faith and reason. Faith and reason. The, the subtitle of his book is Humble Faith and Common Sense uh, of Our Founding Fathers. So we, we establish a government that really separates church and state so that neither encroaches on the other, the purposes and objectives of the others, or to dilute the purpose or objective of the others. The role of government is for us to have a system that allows us to live secure and safely to express and to live out our faith every single day. And we praise God for that today. That is our great praise to the glory of God that we live in a place where this is true. We become then, this is where we step in. We're the bearers of truth. Not government ultimately. Yes, God's people within the system of it all. But we have the freedom to worship him every day and to proclaim the gospel without fear. And here in 1 Timothy, Paul tells us why there is this turning away. Do you sense it in our day? Do you sense that people are turning away? Could it be that we're experiencing, even in our day, he said in latter times it'll come, the great apostasy. Let's get our minds around this today and, and see what our role is in this as we think about integrity in an age of duplicity. We're going to talk about the three R's, if you will, of uh, of this apostasy. We're going to talk about the reason for it, the result of it, and then the remedy of it, the three R's. Some of you like me are old enough to remember the three R's of education, right? Reading, writing, and arithmetic. You remember this? Um, evidently spelling wasn't one of the core principles. Um, <laughs> because only one of those starts uh, with R. <laughs> just just going to be clear today, try to be real clear. Today, we're going to read God's word and we're going to draw from uh, chapter four of first Timothy. And I want to do what we've done throughout this, uh, this series throughout the summer as we read God's word together, proclaiming it in honor of it. Would you stand where you are and I will read this over us. I can imagine this being read to the people in Ephesus first out loud before the congregation. Now the spirit expressly says that in later times, 
Some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. Who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything God has created, created by God is good. And nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. This is the word of God for us today. Praise be to God. You may be seated. So let's look at the reason for this apostasy, the result of it, and the remedy for it. First, the reason in verses 1 through 2. We see the reason, the root of the problem. Look at verse 1. Now, now. Okay, watch this. Now, currently, the Spirit. The definite article here brings attention to the Holy Spirit. This is important to note because he's now, you heard it, he's going to talk about other spirits. He says, the Spirit of God is speaking, and in latter times, some will depart from the faith. This latter times, by the way, the latter times, uh, this is from the time that Christ was risen, the first advent to the second. So now, what many would call the church age, in latter times, we live in the latter times. Some will depart from the faith. Now catch this, the faith is the entire Christian experience, entire Christian, all of Christian doctrine. We'll turn away from the whole of Christian doctrine Now, there's debate here as to, wait, are these people who are saved and now they've turned away where they once part of the flock, they've been saved, but now they have turned away? I believe that uh, we can settle that debate by scripture, interpreting scripture. One of the orthodox, orthodox, if you will, certainly a Baptist orthodox theology, what the reformers called the the perseverance uh, of, of the saints, the perseverance of the saints, or once saved, always saved, is how we might call it, the assurance of your salvation. You did nothing to gain or achieve your salvation, so you can do nothing then to lose it. It's all based on what Christ has done for you, and of course, good works are the signs of proof of faith. So they're always tied together. But I want you to think with me for a moment. If church membership is a sign of one's faith, and I believe that it is, and we're seeing a dramatic falling away in our day. Uh, I've referenced not too long ago that Gallup poll started in 1937. Think about this. Two years before our church was established, 1937, started to do a poll every year, research, as to uh, those who claim church membership. Now, you know, you, you've probably kind of heard or maybe from me a sense of where this goes. 1945, the highest point in the history, well, since 1937, 76% claimed church membership. And then we saw it right about 70% for six decades. Pretty much remained the same until about the turn of the century, 2000. We saw a dramatic shift. Now, I'm old enough to have been a part, been a pastor, been in ministry all this time. To watch this take, take place, the question I'm asking today, is this the great apostasy? Is this the great turning away? Because what we see now, the report came out just um, months ago now for this year. And for the first time since 1937, that number of those who claim church membership is below 50%. 47%. Gets lower with each successive generation. So that millennials, not Gen Z, but millennials are just at 36%. There is a great turning away that is taking place in our day. To compound, to compound the challenge, I'll get to the hopeful part here in a moment because I am hopeful. A New York Times op-ed article not too long ago, Russ Douthit wrote, entitled Waking Up in 2030. I don't know if you read this. He says what, what I had sensed, I hadn't seen anybody put it down, but I, that, 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 that he, he says this, the suspended time of the pandemic has put history on fast forward. Whatever trends we've been seeing, perhaps you've seen this in your business, we've seen it in other places, and whatever trends we saw, whether positive or negative, we're seeing them were catapulted 10 years ahead. And many are saying this has taken place. He even references a commitment, an engagement in the church. Now, the hopeful part for me is this. I've thought about this for a long time. God is refining his church. 
God is refining his church. I'm reminded of a time when Jesus, the disciples came around him. He's talking about drinking his blood and eating his flesh, talking about the commitment that we're to make to him to die to ourselves. And they come alongside Jesus and say, hey, hey, could you just ease, the, you know, don't talk about that because that's not going over well. And people are leaving. And do you remember what Jesus said? Are you guys going to leave now? Are y'all going to leave now? And Peter says, where else would we go? You have the words of life. You alone are our Lord. So what I'm seeing, is those who are committed are radically devoted to the Lord. Now, we'll always have those of us, could it be, that just kind of show up on church on Sunday and not live for Jesus Monday through Saturday, every other day of the week. But the problem is clear. And Paul is reminding us today that the problem is false teachers come and pull away the shallow and the gullible who do not currently now hold to the truth of God's word and live it out. And then he offers three successive stages or characteristics. One is a spiritual cause, a demonic cause. One is what we call a human cause. He's using humans always in this effort. The evil one is. And then the third is a moral cause, devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings. This is a major teaching for us today. We're so prone to say the problem in our nation is, it's, well, it's education. We need more education. And, and there is an issue there. It's a breakdown of the family. Those are issues. It's a political problem. It's a racial problem. It, it's a, it's a, uh, the, a divisive nature within our, 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 our country or for, for many in recent days. It's a psychological problem. It's a, it's a mental health problem. The scripture tells us it's a spiritual problem. At the root of it all, is a spiritual problem. And we need to declare this. We need to say it out because the spirit says explicitly, says that there are demonic forces at work in the world. And in the modern West, we're so quick to blame it on all other things and we can figure it out with an American pragmatism. We can figure this out on our own. I've been around the world enough and many of you have been that in other parts of the world, this is not the case. In other parts of the world, where we've been to India, Bangladesh, and Africa, other places around the world, demonic forces at work in the world are how people frame the reality of what's going on in the world. It makes sense to them. Where we can't seem to make sense of all that's happening because we've forgotten. How can we combat the evil one if we don't even believe that he is, he is at work in our lives? So we combat this spiritual forces are combated with spiritual resources, spiritual weapons. How would we know if we're fighting up against spiritual realities or if we have altogether believed practically, fundamentally, that they're really not at work in our lives? Your prayer life will reveal it. Your prayer life. The greatest cause for unanswered prayer in our lives is prayerlessness. And we need to get on our knees before God and as a church to say, Lord, we know that there's an explicit counteraction to the great work that you're doing in our church and in our lives. We saw it in Jesus' ministry. He shows up on the scene, the spiritual force to overtake darkness and demons and the evil one, and then we see an explicit counterreaction. It's, it's like no other place or time in history. Because you know this, do you not? In the fourth quarter, uh, you can expect fouls. You can expect flagrant fouls by a frustrated team that is losing and on their way out. And we see this even in our day. And yet the word of God tells us in 1 John 4, verse 4, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. We can march on with the truth of God boldly because the spirit of God is guiding us. And this is what Paul is saying. The Holy Spirit is guiding us, and yet there's demonic spirits at work as well. This is why, do you know otherwise sensible, seemingly logical people uh, who maybe they're very logical and very successful in their profession, and yet you, you start to talk to them and they, they believe something crazy. Like they, they, they fall into some falsehood or, or some, some crazy notion why is that demonic spirits and falsehood that is guiding people away deceitful spirits they're devious disguised even as angels 
perhaps disguised as your favorite news personality, cultural commentator, or writer, your favorite politician, or thought leaders. And yet Paul says they can come into the church. They're puppets and they're being used by the evil one. Look at verse two. Through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. So the first cause is demonic cause. The second now you could say is a human cause. Look where this goes, insincerity of liars. This is the word hypocrisis. We get the word hypocrites. They're wearing masks. So now we have people who are teaching, even within the church, who live duplicitous lives. So either they, they don't even believe what they're teaching, because, and it's proven by that they don't live it out, integrity in an age of duplicity, or they have been so deceived that they actually believe what they're teaching. The first cause is spiritual. The second is a human cause. Satan, the evil one, using others to lead others astray. The third cause is what I, I would say a moral cause. They've lost a moral compass. Did you catch that? The word is cauterizo. We get the word cauterized. There were two meanings of the word in the Greek. One was uh, like a hot iron branding, sealing on a, on a cattle where you, you brand the cattle. The other is more of a medical sense of the word cauterized, where, where, where a skin or a nerve is cauterized. It's rendered insensitive, right? It, it's, it's anesthetized. It's, it, it's deadened. So listen, by arguing with yourself or how about arguing against the truth, against your own conscience, against the spirit of God at work in your life, suppressing warnings and alarms of God's truth, the, its voice is smothered and eventually silenced. Argue with your conscience long enough. Argue with the truth of God long enough. You'll be handed over to falsehood. In what area of your life are, do, are you doing this even now? The slippery slope. Argue with your conscience long enough. Lean into a lie repeatedly over time. You will become an apostate. You will turn away. And if you believe that private sin in your life will not find you out, continue down the path you're being deceived. If you believe that, that there's certain sin in, in a particular area of your life that's private, it's not impacting or affecting you, the rest of your life, you're being deceived. This is exactly where the evil one wants you and me to live. If you believe that you have no power over sin in your life, you will live like you have no power. Over sin. If you live or believe that you're not fully forgiven in Christ, you'll live like you're not forgiven. And God's word needs to constantly, consistently come back to us because consistent disobedience without repentance leads to the life in apostate. And God is calling us to his word. He's calling us that the, the reason for this apostasy is demonic. Look at the result, verse three and four. The, the result is their seared conscience, but now he's piqued our interest. And you saw it earlier in verse three. Those who forbid marriage require abstinence from food. And you're probably thinking like me, out of context, this sounds strange. This doesn't even apply to me. And yet it does in big ways. Listen, the Ephesian church uh, here, we see forerunners of Gnosticism that shows up fully orbed, fully developed in the second century, a strong dualism here. So this is important to understand. Spirit is good, matter is bad. So any kind of human desire, nor, even normal desires for sex or food are evil, right? So you can see then a quick turning away. So here's a good summary diagnosis. As you think about false teaching, or if we tend to propagate false teaching ourselves, maybe in our personal lives, and it's this. Here's a good diagnosis. False teachers forbid what the Bible allows, and they allow what the Bible forbids. We see this. False teachers want to forbid people from living in the freedom of grace and attach their own, uh, ultimately, law, their own rules onto other people's lives. Are you, do you tend to do this? Maybe it's a judgmental spirit that we have sometimes. We, we seek our own self-righteousness and we tend to tag then our own thoughts, our own preferences on other people. This can happen. I've seen this throughout my, my ministry where, where someone would say, I'm passionate about this particular non-core thing and I want everybody to follow after this. Adding to, here's what they're doing. Adding to, it's Jesus plus. It's a pseudo-Christian 
uh, approach to life. This is where we find false teaching. And Paul says no matter is, is inherently evil. Rather, God has created it and can be received thankfully and joyfully. And for us to put restraints on things that God does not put restraints on is to then claim to be God ourselves. We saw this in the garden, didn't we? Uh, the, fir- the fall. You can not eat from this tree, but you can eat from any other tree. We tend to do the same. We tend to say, you know what? You can't eat from that one, but you can't eat from that one or that one or that one or that one. Instead, you've, you've, we've got to, to come focused on the gospel and let the spirit of God give us freedom for those things that are not, not core. There's another path to holiness is what these false teachers are saying. It's Jesus plus something. So the overreaction to all this can also get us into trouble. Uh, Paul did say that not everyone is to marry. And so uh, not everyone, and and even how about eating or drinking without moderation is also uh, a problem. So sin that leads to licentiousness instead of to freedom of obedience. Paul says, hey, shall I, at the end of the day, shall I, uh, can I eat shellfish today? Uh, on, On the 4th of July, yes. Can I refrain from it? Yes. Can I eat lots of hot dogs today? Yes, I'm going to, in moderation. Shall I get married or shall I wait for one who you have prepared? Yes and yes. Can I live my life as a single and glorify God even in my sexuality? Yes, yes. I think God's favorite word is yes, yes. We too often want to bring the law back and put others into our own uh, box of, of, of preferences. He's echoing Jesus' teaching in Matthew 15, 11. He says, not what goes into the body that defiles a person, but what comes out, other words, out of the heart, out of the mouth in particular. You might remember Peter's vision in Acts where there's this strange vision. There's this sheet with all kinds of animals on it that's coming down out of heaven. And, and he hears this voice that says, kill and eat. How strange is that? And, and Peter, a good kosher observant Jew, he says, I can't eat that. I can't do that. And he said, no, no, you can't. What God says is good is good. And and he now is is setting us free. And then Peter goes on to meet Cornelius, a non-Jew, a Gentile who comes to faith. And then the door is open. The gospel goes to the whole wide world. No longer are we following the, the law. Now it is the grace of God. So the reason for this apostasy is demonic activity. The result is Jesus plus a works-based theology. Be careful how you lean towards that. And then finally, we'll close with this, the remedy in verse four. For everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. So I love this, uh, a quote from Tryon Edwards. He was an American theologian in the late 1800s. He said this, Between two evils, choose neither. Between two goods, choose both. There's great freedom that God gives us to glorify him in all things. Listen, we have the good news. And the good news is that we've been forgiven, that we can live in this freedom. The reason for this apostasy, this turning away is demonic. Don't forget that. The result of it is Jesus plus something. And we tend to lean that way. But I want to hit rewind before we partake of the Lord's Supper together because in verse uh, three, chapter 3, verse 16, hit rewind because look at this. The ultimate praise, okay, here it is. The remedy is praise and thanksgiving. This is what he's saying. Praise and thanksgiving. Freedom and thanksgiving. So we hit rewind and look at what he says. Great indeed, we confess. Listen to this poetic expression of the gospel. Is the mystery of godliness. There's a mystery of darkness and demonic spiritual forces, but there's a a mystery of the gospel, the spirit of God at work. He was manifested in the flesh, Christ coming to us, vindicated or justified by the spirit, by the resurrection, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. This is the gospel. This is the core right at the center of first Timothy. And this poetic expression gives us the the, the image of Jesus, mighty to save, mighty to transform our lives, mighty to transform a nation. As God's people live for him, hit rewind again. 
And we see in verse 14, this is where we've said, this is why he's written this. I hope to come to you soon. I'm writing these things, and if I delay, that you may know how, to, how you ought to behave in the household, the oikos of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buster, buttress of truth. Now, I want you to catch this. The church then becomes the vehicle by which this truth is marching on into our culture and around the world through those of us who have given our lives fully to him. The church, we, you, are a bastion, a bulwark, a tower of truth as you live your life for God this coming week. May we never forget the heart and core of our lives and our identity and our message is the gospel. Jesus Christ having come for us, he says, coming down to be with us, given his life over, proclaimed to the nations, believed upon his word, and now our lives have been transformed. And so, I want you to now find your elements there. Uh, if you're watching us online, perhaps you can find something that would be similar. But we have our elements there in the pew in front of you. If you would grab one, if someone needs to pass one to you, you can share with one another uh, these elements that you'll find in the, um, in the pew racks in front of you. As we come to a moment of prayer, and before we do, I want to just offer this. All of you watching online and others of you, we have resources for the sermons that you can then apply throughout the week. Our hope is not just you hear the word and leave, but to, this week we want you to read 1 John chapter 2, 1 through 14. Spend, a time, uh, spend time in confession and prayer before the Lord this week. Uh, and, and say, Lord, where am I seeing? Where am I uh, receiving some false teaching? Do everything you can to combat it and remove it from your life.